<laughs> um, first things first, I just want to touch on Caleb, a little bit of your story. You're talking about the fire and talking about how flammable that is. What yeah. really, what is, uh, what, what caused you really to, to go that route? You know, I feel like it's been, just to be honest, I feel like it's been a life theme for me. I was saved at 15 years old and called into ministry at 16. And um, I was so, just to be honest, I was like, I used to live lukewarm. And when I was set on fire, when the Holy Spirit filled me and I was called into ministry, I felt like God released me to a ministry of saying to Christians, get out of that place and get on fire for God. You know, Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. And you know what I'm saying? And so I feel like uh, that is the, the, the direction. That I, that's the reason why I wanted to go there. But I also, I, wanted, I took a look at the life of Peter and even just the disciples. And I saw the disciples, they were with Jesus for three years day by day. They were with Jesus uh, when he was ministering. They were with Jesus when he was healing people. They were with Jesus when he was teaching. Yeah. They got all of his instruction. And yet the second that Jesus was put in chains and shackles and the second that he was facing a uh, trial for crucifixion, what did they all do? They all ran away. Right. And then not only that, but Peter denied Jesus three times. And so we see that, that they were with Jesus for three whole years, ministering alongside Jesus, but they needed something. And then I look at Peter after he, de- he, he denied Jesus three times. But then there's another moment where he stands on a platform and he preaches his first sermon ever. And 3,000 people right. get saved. Right. Not only that, they get baptized. Like if, that, if I preach my first sermon ever and 3,000 people got saved, I would drop the mic and I would quit ministry right there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just being real. But what was the thing? That caused Peter from Peter the coward to be Peter the courageous. Yeah. It was the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yeah. It was the filling of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Holy Spirit that filled him. And so I, I desire to be a man filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I feel like this generation is hungry for that power. So yeah. good. It's so, so good, good bro. Let me, let me say something off that. One is I love your subject. I think it's so powerful. I remember preaching a message. A lot of you guys probably weren't around here at this time. I preached a message called Young and on Fire. One of the illustrations I was saying was... Uh, there's a silversmith, and a silversmith puts the silver into the fire, and all the dross comes off, all the dirt, all this yeah. stuff. And so how did it get clean? It got on fire. Yeah. And a lot of you guys are trying to so fix cool. your life through pragmatic steps, practical things. You want to fix your anxiety? Get on fire for God, and it will clean you up. That's so good. Don't make me start preaching. I'm a white boy, but somebody on, shout, Deb. this is why I'm hot. Come on. Yeah, I can preach too, guys, all right? I'm just letting That's you know. So By the way, I think Caleb's so on fire, his knees burned up. I don't know yeah. what happened. It's, it's all the prayer. It's all the yeah. prayer. Yeah. I'm just saying. But I think that's such a relevant subject. And can I tell you, just a challenge to all you guys and those that are watching online, man, have your one goal, your one pursuit, get on fire for yeah. God and watch everything else fall into yeah, place. Yeah, that's good. Everything else. I was, just, I was just doing a wedding this past Friday. I'm going to talk now, okay, guys? You guys go with that? <laughs> I did a wedding this past Friday, and I was just preaching it. Um, but there was this, there's this, I, I, I put on dress shirts and stuff like that. And as a kid, when I wasn't really familiar with putting on nice clothing, I was started from the bottom up, bottom, and then going all the way up. But I learned that I'm supposed to go from the top down and I do the top button. One time I was walking out of the house and I went bottom up and my mom was like, you gonna go out in public like that? I'm like, what do you mean? I look fly. What are you talking about? And, uh, she goes, look at your shirt. And it's all jumbled. It's all messed up. I look like a hooligan walking outside. And, uh, she goes, do it from the top button. And so I realized if I had the top button first, everything else seems to fall into place. Right. Yeah. And if you put and prioritize God first, man, everything else so good, man. falls right into place. Everything else. I like, just, I like just buttoning the top button and just not even worrying about the rest. Just, just yeah, just go Mexican gangster on him. I love it. I love it. That's incredible. That's incredible. I love that. Shane, now talk to us a little bit about favor. I know favor is not fair, but... You talked about how when you were on a plane, y'all were all the way in the very back of the plane. And because of who your dad knew, yeah. right. because of the connection your dad had with the pilot, y'all got moved up to the front. Praise God. Talk about that. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> come on. Anybody love legroom in the plane? Come on. I don't get planes, right? You're sitting, and you can't have your chair back. As if the chair back is that big of a difference, right? You're like this. All right, let's put it back. All right, cool. <laughs> And the flight attendant's like, oh, you have your seat back, don't you? Oh, my bad. I was going to die like this. <laughs> now I'm safe. That is so true. Whatever. But that is so true. I feel legroom healing. Is, healing is coming over the room right now. Shane. Legroom. <laughs> legroom is, is life. And, and so, is life. but I, I came across the story of favor because of the story of Esther. I did a recent series on Esther. 
And Esther, I feel, is, is so overlooked. Come on, women of God, rise up. <laughs> We're over here talking. Come on. It's because I married a powerful woman, so I need to preach about women. Feminists. No, uh, so... So, but throughout the book, it talks about how she was winning favor in the sight of everybody. We always think of favor as something that's, you know, favor between me and God. But did you know that when you're favored by God, you get favor in the eyes of people? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so non-believers start favoring you, and they don't even know why. It's just because you're favored. Come on, yeah. that's so good. Come on somebody. Come on, somebody. We need a generation of people to know and walk with the confidence of knowing that you have the approval of your father. It reminds me when I first started driving, I drove my dad's 1997 Chrysler Concorde. And, uh, and it wasn't my car I didn't pay for. I talk a lot about my dad because he's, he's the man. But, you know, I, I knew that that was my, my dad, that was my dad's car, but he gave me permission to drive it. And so if I got pulled over, my name was not on the registration, but I had the approval of my dad to drive it. And so when you go in that confidence, you know that you have a backing, right? And when you have that backing, you have that approval, it gives you a confidence that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And that's the difference between driving a stolen car and driving your dad's car, is because you know <laughs> that even though it's not your car you have approval and I, I believe our generation needs this because we're looking for approval in all the wrong places, right? Yeah, we're right. looking for approval in relationships, and we're looking for approval in our job. And, and if our friends are more educated than us, then all of a sudden we feel like we're less than. Did you know that you're not favored because of how well you're educated you are, what your last name is, what your zip code is, how much you make, where you went to school, where you went to high school, if you live in Ashland or Framingham or Natick or wherever these towns are around here? I want you to know that you are favored because you are a son. Come on. You're a son. You're a son. And when you remember that you're a son, Man, everything changes. Yeah, so, yeah. Good, so good. So that's that's. Tell him about. Tell him about the. Uh, it's in the blood. I don't want to give it's, it away. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell him that. So Esther, check this. So so Esther was in a competition to become queen of Persia, right? Esther was a Jew, and so there was this big competition. The women went through six months of spice treatment, six months of oils, and all this stuff. And come on, ladies, and, uh, who wants that? Yeah. I kid you not. Go and read Esther. And then the moment came where all the women would go before the the king and the one that the king chose would be the queen and what I love about this is that all these women went through and they weren't selected these are all Persian women but then Esther comes through and she's selected because she was favored but what differentiated Esther from everybody else you know all the other women were Persian but what differentiated Esther was her blood was the fact that she was a Jewish woman. You know, and so we, we get to the point where we can draw a line of connection to us and say, we aren't favored because of where we were born. We're favored because of the blood. And that's not the blood of, of Jews or the blood of Gentiles. We're talking the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what gets us approval. That's what reminds us that we are sons. Approval and favor is in the blood. Touch two people and say you're favored. Come on. I got to tell you, first of all, that was fantastic. Second of all, I can't stop looking at your eyes, you know. This guy's got some of the most incredible eyes. They're piercing blue. I mean, come on, somebody. If he wasn't, if he wasn't already married. Married, two years, happily. Married. Praise God. <laughs> uh, Don't get Alini's nails out right now. That girl got some claws. Uh, no, I, I love that conversation of favor. And um, I mean, it really reminds me of the difference between being set apart and, and you know, being, being in, in one with the crowd. And um, we talked about it earlier in our leadership Devo before the, before the service tonight, but uh, Romans 12, too, it tells us to not conform to the ways of the world, yeah. but be, be different, right? It says, do not be conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing right. of your mind. Yeah. But that renewing comes from being yeah. in with the, the blood of Christ and being a, a son and or daughter yeah. of God. So I just love yeah. that. That's a fantastic correlation and awesome story, bro. Um, moving forward. I want to get to know you guys a little bit. I want the crowd to kind of get to know your hearts a little bit and a little, little bit of your background as well. So, uh, Caleb, can you tell us a little bit about what might be going on in your life and in New Hope as well, your church? For sure. Um, I love, well, I'm married, first of all, and my beautiful, talented, gifted, amazing wife is here. Stace, can you just raise your hand real quick? And this is my beautiful wife. We've been married for over two years now. And uh, we're happily married, and the evidence is because I have successfully impregnated her. And so that's the weirdest way of saying it. Um, by the way, while I'm on the subject, I, I have come to the honest conclusion that, that um, having a, a baby in the womb is, is the most strangest thing that has ever Do you agree with me, Devin? And so either way, um, our, we're having a baby girl. Come on, we're excited for that. It's a baby girl. And she's kicking. She was kicking the other day. 
and I still haven't got to, uh, to feel the kick either way. Um, <laughs> married for two and a half years. I'm loving, I'm lo I just love marriage. Marriage is, is so much fun. And so um, I'm enjoying ministry. I, I'm, I'm the youth and young adult pastor at my church called New Hope Chapel in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And God's doing a really great thing. And um, it's kind of an insignificant place, but, but I, I want to remind you guys that, that was the, the Plymouth Rock is in Plymouth, like 1620, the come pilgrims, come on. come on. And in Plymouth, like the Mayflower, all that good stuff right in Plymouth, that's where we do ministry. And um, it's really cool because I really believe that um, that was the, it is the birthplace of America, but I really believe God's doing a very specific thing right there in Plymouth uh, in bringing a revival. And yeah. we're seeing, we're seeing uh, the kind of the beginnings of a, a, a beautiful move of God right there in Plymouth. And, you know, like people are just coming to Christ all the time. We had 14 people give their life to Jesus wow. for the first time uh, two weeks ago on, on our Wednesday, Sunday. And so God's doing a great thing. And um, I'm just excited to, to be a part of it. Wow. That's awesome. And I love the correlation you talked about uh, Plymouth Rock. And we know that Peter is the rock on which Jesus built the church. Well, Plymouth Come is on, also man. the rock in which we built this country, too. Come so on, man. I see something there, man, and I'm with you guys. So I'm I agreeing that. in prayer with y'all that you guys are going to have a revival and do something big out there. I really appreciate that. Man. Absolutely, Thank you. man. Now, Shane, catch us up a little bit. What's going on in your life? What's going on in the city a little bit? This dude forgot to say that he started, like, a conference last year. He just <laughs> totally left out that big detail. Come Gathering on, conference. Come on. He's, he's a man of humility. Yeah, but amazing, amazing stuff. Um, so my life is uh, going well. Uh, me and Caleb got married in the same month, in the same That's year, right. to different people, of course. Right. Uh, <laughs> True. So my wife is my wife is over here. I pointed her out. She uh, whenever I whenever I preach anywhere, I always ask her when I'm done, and I think this is just a pastor thing. How did I do? I always ask her how I did, and she said she loved it. Except it was just she, the only parts she loves is the parts that are all about her. She's like, <laughs> I loved it, but all the parts that were just about me. I'm like, wow, girl, self-centered. Humble yourself. <laughs> but but anyway, we've been married for no. I'm just playing. Uh, we I'm not playing, but I am. So we were we've been married for. I'll hear it later. So we were married. We've been married for two years. Uh, we, do, we do ministry together, and, uh, and, and we lead uh, two young adults groups, one in Rhode Island called the City of Rhode Island, and one in Boston called the City of Boston. You're a beast, bro. And uh, we got some city people in the house, and, and hey, there we go. And we're, part, we're under the umbrella of Ambassadors Church in, in Rhode Island, and uh, God's, it's so cool to be able to do ministry uh, not only with my wife, but with amazing men of God like, like Caleb and Dev and, and, and just seeing what the Lord is doing across the churches and, and seeing that there's not a spirit of competition to it, but there really is a spirit of camaraderie uh, that we're celebrating each other's victories. And, and so I think so since true. I met these two dudes, like, like it's a game changer for ministry because you can't do ministry alone, yeah. right? It's not only about having a good life partner in your wife or your spouse, but it's about finding men yeah. of God, women of God that you can line up with and just tackle hell together, right? That's, that's what we're doing. And so ministry is going real well. You know, there's, there's setbacks, there's, there's disappointments, but at the end of the day, what sustains is the sense of calling. You know, you, you just remember that you're favored, right? And you remember that you're called and, and that's, what, that's what keeps you going. And so we say it all the time in church, right? The best is yet to come. I think we even said it during worship, right? We say it in every church service ever, but it's true. It's what we live by. There's this sense that, that what God has in store for us is so much greater than what lies behind us. And, that, and so that's kind of where I'm at, and, and I'm just enjoying the ride of ministry. It's, it's, it's the best life ever. The fact that we get to do this for our life, this is just not fair, man. This is just... This is just favor ain't fair. Favor ain't fair, right? Favor Absolutely. Ain't. I'm favored! Uh, Touch well, two people. Awesome. Tell them your favorite. No, <laughs> oh, and we're not pregnant and none on the way. Just kind of uh, putting that I was, out there. I, was I going prophesy. There. Yes, yes. I was yes, going yes, there. Come on, lift your hands some. We're going to impregnate them. And no, just kidding. Come on, Shane, stand up. That sounded so That's weird. Very odd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just hold it right <laughs> at the right time, people. Oh, at the I love right it, time. though. That's awesome. Um, little shameless plug. You were talking about favor being not fair, and you already preached on that, so that's cool. But um, you, you talked about unity, yeah. and I love that thought. And Devin preached the message a couple, a couple years ago now. It was uh, our first United Night. It was uh, our, almost like our, what, one-year celebration was it, I think? Our one-year celebration, and the, the tagline was, United we stand, divided we fall. And I love that we're seeing a lot of that. Now, we have a conference tomorrow morning out in uh, your church, Exchange Church in Pawtucket, and it's really going to be focused on just getting together and doing ministry together and not competing against each other, but really developing as brothers, as, as comrades, and as family, because that's what we are, and that's what we're doing. We're doing this thing as family. And I, I couldn't be more pleased and honestly honored to be able to serve alongside the three of y'all. So Damn. thank you guys for that. And I appreciate you guys putting that thing together. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 
But so when are y'all expecting? Uh, expecting what? Expecting blessings? Expecting children? Uh, what are we? You expecting? got some pressure. I mean, y'all got married in the same week, the same yeah. year. But you just no. But here's a preaching point, though. Just because somebody else is doing something doesn't mean you have to do it. That's a good point. Come on. Can I preach about it? Can I? <laughs> my wife. That was my wife. Can, can, because I think. No offense. I'm just talking about the fact that sometimes. How, I how do we our, become the bad guys? Like. <laughs> We're just loving we're our lives, this around, bro. <laughs> loving ministry. We just well, turn it around on us. No, but here's the thing. Sometimes I find that our generation struggles with, you know, if we have to do what everybody else is doing. Right. Yeah. Even to the point of pregnant. Like, geez, man. Like, we have to take it that far. But, uh, <laughs> right? Like, oh, they applied to that school. I got to apply to that school. They got that job. I got to get a better job. They're getting that salary. I got to make a dollar more. They're doing this. I got to do that. They're from there. I got to move there. They're from, they're doing that. They're, you'll never keep up. Do you. And be cool with being you, right? Good, like, like there's, there's no need for us to live in this constant stress of performing to be like other people that we're never going to be. You know? And, 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 man, there's nothing more beautiful about a woman. Let's talk about women first. There's nothing more beautiful. I'm feminist. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more beautiful than a woman who knows who they are in Christ. Come on. Come on. And can be that girl without having to be every other girl. Yeah. Come on. And to the men. That's so good. To the men, because you guys aren't off the hook. There's nothing more attractive to a woman, I think, than a man who knows who they are, and they Sing don't have up. to be like every other man. So Just be you. They will like, they will love you for, you imagine getting married, and you've been being somebody else this whole time. All of a sudden, you're married, and now you're forced to be yourself, and they're in love with who they thought you were, and not the man you really are. Wow, wow. All of this because you asked if we were expecting. And the point of all of this... You're welcome. It's just to say, man, you got to be comfortable in your skin. Favor, just know, you're you. I am Shane Elton Lima, forever. Elton, that's right. And, and forever, like, that, that's who I am. I'm not a sport. I'm not an athlete. I'm not as buff as any of these guys on the stage. I probably weigh more than all three of them. But... But you know what? I'm cool with who I am. And when I start kind of feeling like, well, I need to be more like Devin, I got to get a reality check, usually from my wife. You got to be you. Yeah. Right? Let's just be real. Let's throw off the facades and start acting like real people. When you start comparing yourself to other people, remember how good God has been to you. Come Comments? Come on. Uh, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So actually, I was just uh, preparing uh, yesterday. And uh, I think in uh, February, my wife and I are going to be talking about this, but we kind of accurately have said before, you can't love somebody else unless you first love yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about being comfortable in your own skin. Shane or Caleb, maybe you guys can comment on this. Uh, how have you come to have confidence in yourself, confidence in your own skin? Because I think that's something that is crucial yeah. if you're going to do this thing successfully, if you're going to do life successfully, certainly ministry successfully. Yeah, right. How do you, first of all, rid of comparison? And then uh, how do you love yourself? Yeah. What would you guys say? That's so good. You know, the truth is you have to be yourself because everybody else is taken. <laughs> like you're stuck with yourself. Like like it or not, you're stuck with yourself. So make a decision. Are you going to truly be yourself or are you going to chase after an image that you, that you want to be? And I feel like social media, if I can talk about it for a second. Talk about it. I like, you know, social media is good. Okay, let me qualify like that. It's good. It has, you know, connectedness and stuff like that. But let me tell you, social media Everybody puts their projected self on social media. You scroll through Instagram, you put your best, your best selfie on Instagram. Mom. You put your, you put the best meal that you ate that night. I don't know why we're posting Instagrams about meals. Like that's really weird. Nobody wants to see your meal. Either way, we're, we're pro, we put our projected self, and then and then we get in the image, and then we say, okay, I have to be like them. I have to match up to them because they look so good. They're having the most adventurous life you could ever dream of. And then when you you come to the reality of yourself, you're like well, I'm not that good, and I'm not that good looking, and I'm not that, and let me just, let me just break off that line. Nobody is that good. Yeah. We are That's all good. fallen. We all have failures. We all have flaws. We all have sins, and so, and so what we have to be is ourself. Right. Right. I find it interesting that this generation seeks after authenticity in everybody else except you, yeah. right. wow. and I want to be someone that's true to myself. And in the second that you start comparing yourself to someone else is the second that you're, you're going to have low self-esteem. Yeah. 
It's like you're going to think, man, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Devin, you, gave, you, gave, uh, you were vulnerable a couple months ago, I believe, at the 508. He said, um, and I think you spoke for every pastor that has ever lived. Yeah. He said something like, you know, I hear Shane preach. I hear Brian Bullock preach. I hear these guys preaching. And I think to myself or I hear a lie that I'm not going to be as good as them. And I'm not going to be as, I'm not as talented. And I, I do the same exact thing. And we all do, right? Yeah. Maybe it's not preaching. I don't know what it's for you. You fill in the blank for your own life. I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to make that much money. I'm not going to be able to be like that person. I'm not going to be able to be that successful like them. But the problem is you have to, I mean, the reality is you have to know I am called by God. Yeah. I have an assignment that God has given to me, and I am the only one that is going to fulfill the assignment that God has given to me. Nobody else can fulfill what God has called you to do, so you do it. Do you, boo-boo. You got to do you. Nobody else can. Just be yourself because everybody else is taken. I I would, like, right along the lines of what you said, I would answer the the question about confidence in in two parts. First of all, I still struggle a lot with confidence, Um, and, and I, and I, just, yeah. just being frank about it. Sometimes I, I just, I, I struggle with it. And then second off, the confidence that sometimes I do muster up came, comes from a place of brokenness, really. Um, it's from, I, and I talked about this when I spoke at the 508 back in May, some of you guys were here for that night, it was when I faced depression uh, when I was early teens and then again in my early 20s. Um, that, that, those seasons of brokenness for me were really, what then showed me who I am in Christ. And I wanna speak to that person who may be sitting in here and you're in that season of depression right now. And let me tell you something, I still have to be vigilant with myself about depression because just because I'm healed from it doesn't mean I should just let my guard down, right? So there's like times where I find like, uh, is it gonna try to creep back? And, and, and man, you gotta start you know, speaking against things in the name of Jesus and you gotta stay vigilant. But I'm telling you, when you come through a season like that, and, uh, and God delivers you from it, it gives you a renewed confidence. Yes. And, and so sometimes I find that my biggest confidence, the best messages I've ever preached, I think, were in my moments of biggest brokenness. So right. It's right. when I stood up there and preached the message to myself because that's the most vulnerable and the most passionate you'll ever be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, but, but like I said at first, I still struggle with it. And I think sometimes in this celebrity pastor culture, you'll look at the guy who's up on the platform and think, well, that guy made it or that woman of God made it. And the fact is, you know, let's just be honest, if you've done this for a long time, you can make it look very easy when you stand up here and talk to people. You can make it look very easy. But I find that behind every person, there's a real story and there's a real struggle. And so I I try to pastor people from the lens of vulnerability. I'm never going to try to pretend to be who I'm not. If I'm struggling, I'll tell the church I'm struggling. If I'm going through something, people will know because I'm not trying to put an image of perfection, something that I'm not. And I think that's the most confident that we can be. It's finally confidence in the fact that we aren't who we, we sometimes claim we are and confidence in Christ. And so that's, that's where I come from on the two kind of two ends of the spectrum is that I still struggle, but the confidence that I do have has come from moments of brokenness. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, knowing who you are yeah. and knowing, knowing what you want right. will allow you to never waver. Yeah. So if you know your identity and you, have, you find your identity in Jesus and then you know what you want out of your life, you have your pursuits in line. That's right. You're never going to waver from right. anything that the, the world can throw at you. Right. So that's so awesome, bro. That's awesome. Both of y'all, that's awesome points. So good. Um, we, we talked a little bit about your wives, but I want to kind of get more into that a little bit. But I want to probe Devin. We haven't really heard from you yet, so <laughs> a little bit. I'm chilling, y'all. I'm, I'm just listening. I want, I want, I want to hear your, your insight a little bit here, too. So let's talk about the pursuit of your wife. What does that look like? How to find like, a godly woman? Where do you find them and how to pursue them? Yeah, I've preached this like a hundred times, um, but uh, to be honest, I don't feel like I was very good at it in the beginning. I definitely, <laughs> she's like, no, you weren't. I'm trying to win brownie points right now, babe. Please let me do this. Um, I really wasn't very good in the beginning, so I don't know if I'm the best model behavior-wise, but, uh, but man, gentlemen, like, you're the pursuer, you know? Uh, women, you are to make him work for it. Yeah, that's true. Make him work. That's true. Like, I, I think the biggest turnoff for a guy is when a woman is desperate for a relationship. Yeah. And uh, it's a girl that will just seek attention, and, and we can all smell it. We can all recognize it. And uh, can I just say, just as a blanket statement, um, Christians, we want to get married way too fast. Yeah. And the Bible says, uh, Scripture says that the two become one. And uh, you better know that one. 
And I think a lot of us put on this facade, this kind of pseudo uh, personality, and we're in the honeymoon phase for a long time. And I don't think you should get into a relationship or you should really get married or talk about engagement until you go through some fights, until you go through some drama, until you go through some stuff, because crisis reveals character. And so you really, I, I'm getting so off point anyways, but uh, I just feel like you need to go through some stuff first. And let me tell you. What I found out when, when I messed up a few times is I found out that Natalia is full of grace. She is full of love. She can forgive me. Come on, you need, you need something like that in a relationship, yeah. people. Yeah. You, come on, talk back to me. Yeah. You need some grace. You need some forgiveness. And so I was so thankful for that. And she gave me grace when I wasn't really pursuing at the time. I was very indecisive. And uh, I'm so grateful that really she <laughs> allowed me to pursue her later. Uh, and I think I fixed it. Did I? She's like... <laughs> I'm just going to say it publicly. Yeah, you did. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that point. Crisis reveals character. Yeah. And it's so true. Who you are in times of that's, struggle. That's Martin Luther yeah. King says, he said, the ultimate measure of a man is not who you are in times of trial. And I'm um, sorry, in times of, um, how does it go? I forget really, but. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> the ultimate measure of a man is not who you are in times of comfort and convenience, but who you are in times of trial and controversy. Right. Come on. So Christ yeah. reveals character. That's such a good point. And I love that. And I feel like relationships are an area where we see a lot of crisis. We see a lot of, of broken relationships. We see a lot of hurt. But I believe that finding a, a woman of God or, or the right woman for your life is going to help you to heal any and all that hurt. Um, I, I heard a message last week, and it was talking about how uh, the greatest healer of all time is love, obviously, and love can, love can heal, and, and heal all wounds and mend all hurt. So let's talk a little bit about what love can do in, in times of that struggle, in times of that pain, in times of those hurt. Yeah. Any one of y'all? Yeah, so fight, uh, disagreements in marriage exist, but here's the thing. I can disagree with my wife, but like when somebody else tries to disagree with my wife, hold, hold on, that's a disagreement with, I can disagree with her, you can't disagree with her, right? <laughs> And it's crazy how love really, love forgets wrongs. Mm. It covers wrongs. It covers a multitude of wrongs. Yeah. You can be in a moment, so and you can have strife with your wife. Hey, and uh, that rhymed. And, bars. Hey, bars. <laughs> Actually, I am on a rap track on one of my guys' albums from the city, so <laughs> I'm a rapper. <laughs> track two. What was it called? It's called before. Well, the, the name of the CD is called Before the King. I don't remember the name of the song. The it's not good. It's trash. Uh, no, it's not trash. I am a rapper. You don't even remember the title of the track. Y'all are trash, straight bro. white. I am the only biracial guy here. I'm not straight white, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. I am. I am straight white. <laughs> white. Um, what was I talking about? But but man, the, I think the 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 crucial the crucial aspect is that. First of all, you gotta love them, yeah, but you gotta like who you're gonna marry too. Mm. Like, you gotta like who they are. Like, y'all gotta have yeah. fun together because that's the thing that's gonna transition you from the fight to the to the to the celebration to the party is just you like being with them. Yeah. Yeah. Like my, let's be honest. I've met both of your wives. All three, all three of our wives are way more worthy to sit in these chairs than us, that's, right? That's true. <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> And they're genuinely amazing women of God, yeah. right? Yeah. And we wouldn't be who we are without them. True. Man, who keeps me grounded is my wife. Who keeps me on, on track when I start getting all weird in the head is my wife. Yeah. Who snaps me back to, to reality and reminds me that I'm called is my wife. And, and, I, and, I, and I thank God because sometimes I'm like, what would I do if I didn't have her? Yeah. You know, who, where, would, where would I be? I wouldn't be able to be half the person I am without having found you know, that, 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 that suitable partner. The pursuit with her was so difficult, man. I, I think I told y'all, three years of, of, of waiting. And even after three years, she said, not dinner, breakfast. And I asked her to Valentine's Day, and she said, not the 14th, I'll go out with you on the 15th. <laughs> not dinner, but for That's coffee. So Perfect and, example, though, of a woman making you work. Man, and she's still making Ladies, me work. Ladies, take some notes. <laughs> She's still making me work, and we've been married for two years. No, but the fact is, you know, when you find that right one, you're willing to do whatever it takes. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it takes. It doesn't matter what you got to do. You're willing. You're willing to wait. You're willing to work. You're willing to pay. You're willing to... One of our girls from the city posted on, on Facebook this week. I think she's here. Is that uh, these millennial men, when, if you're going to ask a girl out on a date, you better be paying. Absolutely. Girl, you're here, right, Tony? She revealed herself right there. I knew yes. it. She's yes. here. She posted it, and we say yeah. Amen. Like, if you can't pay, you shouldn't ask her out. <laughs> True. 
Come on, Shane. It's true. I digress, but, and also, if you can't pick her up. <laughs> so good. So true. Yo, all the ladies love you, bro. And I'm pretty sure all the dudes Feminist. hate you, bro. <laughs> I don't know, man. I grew up with a strong mom and a strong... I have a strong wife, and I just... I don't know. But, like, that's just... Man, dudes, you got to rise up. Like, yeah, where, where are the men? The come men. On. Not the boys, the men. Come on. Not the dudes that are just interested in dating, but the men who want, are looking for a wife, right? Yeah. Like, we're not trying to mess around. What we're trying to do is find a suitable helper so we can live on mission for God. We need these men of God to rise up and pay. So good. So good. Yeah. yeah. And drive. It says a lot, man. Yeah. You can be cheap after you get married, but don't be cheap before. <laughs> that's true. Hey, that's good. Catch her first, and then do that. <laughs> right. Be cheap first. Can I, can I go on a rabbit trail for a second? Uh, scripture talks about, I, I just did this wedding, so it's fresh on my mind. And so uh, scripture talks about how uh, gentlemen, husbands, we are supposed to love our wives like Christ loved the church. Christ gave himself for the church. He died for the church. And so what I want to tell a lot of us today is how do you think, and this is a little different of a subject. I want to come back to it. Uh, Jesus died for the church. That is his bride. And a lot of us, what I want to address, and we're going to do this in the new year, is I want to talk about we need to love the church and go after the church and not talk crap about the church and stop uh, being uh, frustrated about the church and stop talking junk about the church. Like, y'all, gentlemen, let's, like, fall in love with the church, and you will find your Come wife on, in church. Yeah. yeah, You will find your husband in church. And so we're going to talk about this in January. But uh, I love how she made him work. And, gentlemen, you should work in church. You should get involved and, and yeah. connected and rooted in your local church and, like, give your life to that thing. So Be true. on mission, like we were talking about. We have given our lives to the church, and the church has blessed us. God has blessed yeah. us. We are tremendously favored. And uh, can I just give a suggestion to all you guys? You need to be rooted in a local church. You need to go through. We have next steps here. Get through next steps. Get involved with community and serving. I'm doing shameless plugs right now, but I think it's just so important that you have a passion for the local church because Christ yeah. died yeah. for it. Can I just say real quick, like if you, if you were to approach me and you were to say, hey, Caleb, I have a problem with your wife. Like, you got a problem with my wife, you have a problem with me. And so I, I can't, I like, I'm sorry, like I question people that, that just gossip about the people in the church. I question people that, that are so f like frustrated with the local church. Yes, there's, yes, there's failures in the church. Yes, there's, there's pe toxic churches, whatever. But, but can we just like be, be honest? If you are talking bad about the church, you are talking bad about the bride of Jesus Christ. Come on, come on. Like that's his bride. If you talk bad about my wife, I am like, we're going to have a problem. And so like, I, that's so relevant. I feel like we need to plant ourselves. What is that verse? Plant yourself in the house of God and you will flourish. Plant yourself in the house of God and you will flourish. Find a good Bible-based teaching, solid church and just plant yourself there. So good. Yeah. Because God's going to take care of the rest. He's going to bless you. I was at his conference, and one of the guys on the panel said, and this is for those of you that may be coming from unhealthy environments, he says, uh, bad tools can still create beautiful furniture. Yeah. And so you may be in an unhealthy environment, but understand God is sharpening you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes I learned is uh, it's not so much the convictions that you want to have, it's the convictions that you don't want to have, and those are even more powerful. Meaning, yeah. uh, you might come from an unhealthy environment, and you see, I don't want to do that. That sometimes might be more powerful than figuring out what you want to do and what you want to be like. Yeah. And so you might come from an unhealthy environment, but God can use that so greatly and have some deep-rooted convictions. Is this ministering to anybody? Yeah. Does that make sense? That's good, Dad. That's it. That's good. <laughs> What a tease, man. <laughs> yeah, I just... You were getting somewhere, and then yeah. you kind of left me hanging a little bit. That was good. That was good. But that was so good. And you, you, you guys all kind of touched on one point, and what, what I got out of it was when we had our revival nights here in August, Justin Daly was up from Florida, and he gave, a, he gave a message on the local church as well. He talked about honor. And one of the things he talked about was covering your leaders, covering your pastors, yeah. covering the weaknesses that you might see in the church or in the people around you and such. And you guys just kind of all alluded to that. But what covers that is love. Yeah. And you talked about being a man. When, when you're a man, you're able to, again, identify yourself and know who you are. You recognize who you are and you accept who you are and you love who you are. So we see that theme of love again. But then what I want to talk about really is when you're a man is when you realize what you want and what you want to pursue. And we're talking about, again, just relationship and that relational aspect. So talk to me a little bit about what that looks like to... I guess, turn that corner from being a boy to being a man and recognizing the difference between the two and then really pursuing the things of God as a man. Caleb? Let me say something. Dev? 
Uh, First Corinthians, I'm just going to take this one. It's going to be better. First Corinthians 13 talks about this. It says, I believe it's in verse 6, 7, maybe it's 11. I'm not really sure which one. It says, when I became a man, or I talk like a child, I walk like a child. And when I became a man, I put the childish things behind me. So notice there are two stages in every Christian's life. There's adolescence and then there's adulthood. There's no teenage years. And so I think a lot of us are flirting. And we may think we're in adulthood, but the reality is in our spiritual world, we're still in that child adolescent stage. And can I just challenge everybody in this room, you flirt with God, you're, you're leaning in, you're halfway in, halfway out. We were talking about being lukewarm. That is the most miserable place you could be when it comes to your walk with Christ. I want to challenge you in this new year, before this new year comes, go all in with God. All in. Like fully dive in. Like my dad, my dad has this kind of funny phrase for those when we have baptisms is sometimes people will go under the water, but like spiritually they have their hand with their wallet still up and they don't baptize, baptize fully with their finances, with their relationships, with their anxieties, with their stresses. And I would say something else. I'm just going on rabbit trails right now, but I'm, I'm going with it. Uh, some of you guys are complaining and glorifying your problem way more than you're praying about it. And if you stopped complaining about it and started praying about it as much as you're complaining about it, you would get free from some of those problems. Wow. Go all in. Somebody shout all in. All in in with God. And I'm telling you, everything, like I said in that illustration before, everything falls into place when you just go all in. All in. Yeah, that that was, that's incredible. And you you touched on it too, just talking about like really just sacrificing and, and going all in and just offering yourself up as a living sacrifice. Let me say something about that too. Um... I'm just, I want to use Richie as an example because there are countless people in this church, and I want to personalize it for you. Richie uh, got a job recently, and he was going through a certain bunch of different jobs, and he always says to the people, he says, I will not take this job unless uh, you guys give me flexible hours so that I can do ministry at the church. He just made it a core value, a conviction. And I could tell you countless people with names in this room who just say, listen, I'm for the church. And they don't care who says it. They don't care who they say it to. Uh, they just have a conviction about that. And I want to honor you for that. That's a man that's all in right there. That's the reason he's on this platform. That's the reason he has the influence that he has. That's the reason if you're faithful with little, what? You're faithful with much. He's leading our high school ministry. He's absolutely killing it right now. If you're a high schooler, talk to him. Uh, but seriously. Shameless plug. Seriously. Uh, you want influence? So Man, just be faithful with that. Yeah. Have some convictions about the local church. Go all in with God, and you will so be good. blessed abundantly. Yeah. Yeah. Blessed abundantly. Right. Can I just say something over, over you, Michael? Can I just, like, give you a word real quick? We, we were, he's been, we've been, like, voxing. Anybody know Voxer? You know Voxer? Either way. We've been voxing for the past couple weeks, and um, I felt like right when I saw you today, God spoke to me that he is releasing you into another level and another dimension of ministry and anointing and influence. <laughs> And, um, like, bro, you are anointed, and you are covered by God. You're covered by God. And I just feel like I want to let you know that there's favor on your life. And um, I want to do something really quick. Um, Richie, why don't you stand up? We're not done with the conversation. We still got a little bit more. But I want to pray for him. And I'm going to ask you guys, if you would extend your hands if you're comfortable with it. Uh, I know that for some of you guys maybe aren't uh, used to church or anything like that. It might look a little spiritual, but we just believe in the transferring of, uh, of anointing, of favor, and uh, we want to lay hands on him really fast. So if you could just extend your hands, and let's pray for him, guys. Uh, I'll pray. Father, I thank you so much for this man of God. I thank you so much for all that he has sacrificed, given, and I declare that he is favored. I thank you for the fire. I ask that you would increase it on his life in Jesus' yeah. name. Use his life mightily. Whatever anointing is on my life, I pray that you would transfer yeah. it, yeah. double anointing in Jesus' name. God, you're going to use this man greatly. Use his voice, use his skills, use his attitude, his humility, and uh, may you would increase it in favor and yeah, blessing you, in Lord. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, say amen. Thank you. Can I just say something? I just want to say something about, about like, that question about manhood. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean this, I really don't mean this judgmentally or to condemn anyone, but there's a lot of boys in the church, and we need a lot more men in the church. And one point I want to make is if you look all the way back at Genesis, I'm not going to give you the reference because I don't know it off the top of my head, so forgive me. One year of Bible college, okay? Um, If you look all the way in the beginning of Genesis, God created Adam, and he gave him something to do. He gave him responsibility. He gave him work. He, he, He was called to work. That was the first thing. He gave him responsibility. And so, first of all, we have to take as men, and, and this goes for everybody, but we have to take spiritual responsibility of our, of our lives. We have to take responsibility. Not only that, you have to, t- you have to get a job. Like, don't, don't try to find a wife if you don't have a job first. 
You need a job. Right. You got to pay. Right. You gotta pay. So you need a job. Yeah. Don't take your mom's money. You need a job. <laughs> take responsibility. And, and here's, here's what I want to I kind of plug it back into scripture. We, we see the story of Elisha and, uh, Elijah and Elisha. And we see Elisha, he was, um, he was, he was plowing the field. He was plowing the, the ground, and he was working hard. This guy was a hard worker. He was out there day and night. He was plowing the ground, and, um, and he had a job. He, he was taking responsibility. And, and, then, and then we see something kind of interesting in Scripture. Elijah, who was a prophet and, and a miracle worker, a great man of God, he shows up on the scene while Elisha is working, and he puts a, he puts a cloak over him. Representing like the mantle of ministry that he's going to walk in, like the, the calling of God, the assignment of God in his life. Let me tell you, he found it while he was working. He was taking responsibility of his life, and then, and then the call of God came. I feel like so many of us, we're looking for our purpose, and we, we're looking for a job that matches. We're working, looking for a career that matches our calling. And that's great when you get that. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And I really hope you can find that. But just start working and watch God download that purpose Come on your on. life. Come on. I, I think, you know, there might be that person in the room who's like, dang, they're talking a lot about relationships. And the fact is, you know, the reason why we have to talk about it so much is because so many of our lives are a hot mess because of relationships. <laughs> right? Like, our life's a hot mess because of relationships. So we got to preach on it. Right? If we can, because I find, man... The biggest detriment to the calling of God over our life is the people that we're surrounded with, yeah. right? That's good. And so we got to make sure that we're getting, we're getting this right as young people, as young adults. And here's the thing. Like, it cracks me up when, like, junior high, high school, young high school students are going out. I'm like, where y'all going? <laughs> y'all going in your mom's Dodge Caravan? Is that where y'all, like... <laughs> you got to know, like... I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but just stop. Oh, man. That's a, that's a word of the Lord right That's there. a word. Word hey, of wisdom. Hey, turn to your neighbor, uh, five people around, you just say, just stop. Just, just stop. stop. Just stop. Just, just stop. stop. Just stop. Get out of your mom's Dodge Caravan. Shane, you could say that and it's anointed. Like, if I said, get out of your mom's Dodge Caravan, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have any weight. The only one. Um, I just want to take a minute, first of all. Yeah to say thank you, gentlemen, for that. Um, first of all, thank you, Caleb, for picking back up because I was speechless after that, so you carried the conversation. But I just want to honor you guys, and I appreciate the, um, the confidence in me and the prayer and everything. So thank you, boys, for that. But you touched on it a little bit, but purpose. And I want to touch on that a little bit more and camp on that idea. And yeah. it, we, I think that a lot of times, and myself included, I was looking for uh, a way that I could match my purpose with my, my, my profession and my passion all entwined together. And that's hard, y'all. Like, that's not yeah, easy. Is. But I believe that, especially our, our culture and our society now, we all want to make a difference. We want to impact the people around us or impact the world that we live in. And how to do that? How can we do that by working a job that just pays the bills and then finding fulfillment and purpose outside? What's the, that's one of the things that we were talking about in the core box. We didn't talk about laying hands. So y'all threw me off. I wasn't ready for that and unprepared. But let's get back to that. We were talking about um, some of the things that, you know, I think millennials or ourselves or some of the felt needs that we struggle with and purpose was a big one. I think a lot of us are seeking position, not purpose. Wow. That's good. That's and right. Talk about going it. Going back to the story of Esther, Esther had an adopted father named Mordecai and Mordecai was the doorkeeper. Like he was the dude sitting at the door, but he went from being the doorkeeper to being the second in charge over all of Persia, not because he sought the position, but because he was faithful in his purpose, in his current position. He sat at the door as long as he needed to sit at the door and at the right time, the king saw him and promoted him, sat him on a horse, paraded him around the city, and everybody had to bow down to Mordecai, the doorkeeper. And I want to encourage a generation of young people, stop seeking position and start seeking purpose. Because when you seek purpose, God will then promote you to the right position. That's so good. That's so good. I would like to add something. Um, it's, it's funny because I look at the story of Nehemiah at the same time. Right. And Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He basically served the king. And, and, and so he, was, he, was, he had that position. But that was not his assignment. That wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to go back to uh, Jer Jerusalem, Israel, Jerusalem, I think, and to rebuild the city walls and to cause a spiritual awakening to take place in the, in the Israelites. That was his purpose. But right now he was a cupbearer. And then, and then this moment came where he got a report. He got a report from some people that approached him. And they said, listen, it's looking terrible for us. 
Jerusalem is, is, is like, is destroyed. The walls are destroyed. We're vulnerable to any attack of the enemy. Uh, where we have low morale. Nothing, nothing's working out for us. And so the Bible says that Nehemiah, he wept. He wept. He wept and he cried for his, for his people. And he waited for God's favor with the king to send him there. But let me just, let me just say this. I, 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 find, I, I find young people asking themselves all the time, uh, like, where am I called? Yeah. What am I called to do? And I feel like we need to re- replace that question with, what are you broken for? Wow. What wow. are you burdened for? What wow. people group is breaking your heart that so you, you can't stand to see it? And let me just say, that is what your purpose to do. Wow. That is what you're called to do. What are you broken for? So good. So good. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, again, just going back to Pastor Justin Daly when he was up here. That's another thing he was talking about. Really that thought of covering weakness. But he said, if there's a role, a position, a purpose that's not being f- fulfilled in your church, that's because you haven't stepped in there yet. So that's so good. Where are you burdened for? Why are you not stepping into that position on your own? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of us are easy to point out flaws, easy to point out problems, and that's really easy to do is to point out some of the issues. One of the harder things to do and what I want to challenge you guys to do is say, I see a problem and I'm going to be that solution to that problem. Because right. uh, I think all of us, we can, we can easily point it out, but uh, not many of us have the faith, have the wherewithal, have the kind of constitution to say, I'm going to be a solution to this answer. You know what I saw when, yeah. when we wanted to launch this five-week ministry in the young adult ministry? I saw no young adults in this church. Dad, you, or wherever dad is, you remember this time where there was like no young people in this church. In this church specifically, the seats you're sitting in, there was like none. And I just remember we needed to start a young adults ministry. And uh, it was hard work. Samantha, Natalia, uh, we led this together. We, we launched this thing together. And look what's happened now. It's taken hard work. Come it's on. taken sacrifice. It's taken commitment. We've had to pay the price for a lot of different things. So but uh, can I tell you, it was from a broken heart. Yeah. It was from what I hated. That's another way you can find your purpose. What do you hate? Yeah. What do you love? What breaks your heart? What are you gifted in? And uh, uh, it just it stemmed from a broken heart. That's what it was. Yeah. Um, speaking of a broken heart, really, we had a, a high school kid in the community, and we, at this point, we really didn't have a high school contingency. We didn't have a, a high school ministry for this kid to be a part of. But this kid, unfortunately, was going through a hard time, and he ended up taking his own life. And that broke our heart here because he was so close to the local church, but we were so far from him. Wow. You know, we couldn't relate. We couldn't correlate to him. We couldn't reach him. And unfortunately, we got to him before it was too late or when it was too late. And that created a burden in our hearts as well. And we wanted to create that high school ministry so that we had a home for those high school kids, those kids that didn't have a, a church to go to that were disconnected and far from God, far from the church, far from relationship. We wanted to be that for them. We wanted to be all things to all people so that we could be attractive enough that the, the pre-believer would want to come and be around us and just at least rub off on a little bit of what we were talking about and, and the, the relationships and the fellowship that we were having and give them some sense of purpose and some sense yeah. of, of fulfillment and family Family, I think, you, you family, yeah, I'm, I'm speechless right now. You know, fam, family goes a long way. And yeah. if you don't have a family behind you, you got to make a family. You got to create your own family. And that, it's such an important thing in our Absolutely. lives. So, Absolutely. So good. It's good, guys. So good. You guys getting something out of this? Helpful? Yeah.